Welcome to my ongoing experiment where I interview people in pro AV on a mission to elevate their corner of the industry and share those lessons learned with you. My name is Jeremy Birch and I'm happy to introduce you to Nate Schneider today. Nate is an AV systems engineer in Massachusetts, uh, right? Massachusetts, did I get that right? Yep, yep okay. that's correct. Just outside of Boston. Okay. But he's also been involved in a very interesting solo project for the past few years. I won't, live, I won't let his, uh, his studio backdrop give it away, but I'll uh, let him tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, but I think that gives him a unique vantage point in the industry, and I want to explore that a little. But first, I want to start with some questions about you, Nate. Um, how and when did you get started in AV? Well, thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate the, the introduction. And uh, man, what a great question. So I love talking with people about how they got started in the AV so, uh, industry. So this is kind of cool to participate as a guest on, on your project here. Um, so I would say music is a huge part of it. Definitely, I think I got into AV. If I really think about what was like the first step, baby step towards getting into AV, I think it was a love for music. And as a kid playing saxophone, growing out of saxophone, picking up my dad's electric guitar, when I was like 13 and really like getting into like, oh, what's this Fender amplifier? What are these tube <laughs> things that light up? Those are cool. And just kind of like fiddling around with it and, you know, starting a garage band, being the guy that sat next to the four channel Radio Shack mixer um, and just kind of like, hmm, how do we get this to sound good? Um, and then, you know, developing a love for, uh, you know, recording technology. So I think, I think music was kind of like my gateway into AV in general, and then the technology that went with music uh, fascinated me. And, um, you know, probably around that same time when I was, you know, in a garage band, I was also interested in design. So design technology was an elective that I feel very lucky to have been able to get involved with in high school. So I learned AutoCAD Release 14 um, at the same years I was fiddling around with the guitar trying to you know play Metallica and do some cool like chords and, and solos and stuff so I, I kind of had that going for me so it was a drafting class mainly yeah it was it was, a, it was called um, it was called design technology and they taught um, actually they taught you how to how to draft by hand which oh so what year what year was this so man if I go Cause back because I, I learned by hand as well I took a <laughs> drafting class as well and it was by hand this was late 90s, early 2000s, and it was, okay. I was right at the threshold of, I learned how to draft by hand with eraser dust and, and pencils and, and everything and T-squares, and then <laughs> the next year, it was like, okay, the drafting tables were gone. They, they brought in the computers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So I was like right How did that make you feel? Like, don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... it's um, I know I've, I kind of feel lucky to have kind of learned the, the old school. I mean, when you talk to somebody who's been in AV for a long time, you talk about analog tape and just the concept of holding a piece of time in your hand and just understanding like where the technology came from and just how different it was to, to be involved in AV, you know, back in like the seventies or in the eighties versus, you know, today. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, so when I look at drafting technology, and AutoCAD and things like that. I kind of feel lucky to have that experience of like the analog version of, of uh, you know, design technology, kind of just the amount of work that went into it. And so was your first AV, uh, was your first job an AV, uh, uh, a CAD drafting job? No. So actually my first job uh, while I was going to school at UMass Lowell for sound recording technology, technically my first job was as a stagehand. So I would, you know, do live sound for a little theater on campus at UMass Lowell. And, um, that led to doing bigger gigs. I mean, it was just like plays for like kids, you know, field trips and stuff, middle school field trips and elementary yeah. school field trips would come through. Minor, minor stuff. Not, not a whole lot, not a lot of pressure or whatever. <laughs> uh, but then I got to meet some people that mm -hmm. were involved with bigger shows in downtown Boston. And I got kind of an invite one time to, to work at a big show um, at the Aganis Arena. And uh, it was Def Leppard and uh, Brian Adams. And I remember oh, just wow. getting completely blown away like wow this is, this is crazy like just whole the other level yeah. yeah oh that's cool that's cool um so i i have a um question an uh, interesting question for you with your going back to your, your cad background because that that kind of led most 
most directly into your current role as as design engineer i think would that be correct yeah so my main my my title right now is technically av system designer uh three if you want to okay. get really technical but so <laughs> AV system designer is probably how i'd describe myself some people use the term engineer and then i guess it depends on what state you're from if you know you can technically call yourself an engineer or not um but um so you know my, my title's technically design you know av system yeah. design yeah so so for for AV integrators looking to looking for CAD talent, let's say, um, to add to their their, um, their their CAD drafting abilities, would you say that it's easier for them to look for people who already know something about AV and teach them CAD, or the other way around? Look for someone who's been fish, you know formally trained and and is kind of a in CAD already and teach them just what they need to know to put together drawings for an AV company? That is a great question. And um, I, so I think, I think it could go either way. I think it depends on the person. Um, if I look at my personal story, I really learned AutoCAD um, apart from AV. So I, I learned AutoCAD and we were doing, you know, drawings of flanges and drawings of, you know, different random you know, sprockets and, and things like that. That's kind of where I cut my teeth and, and learned AutoCAD. So for my personal experience, I learned kind of like I got classically trained in AutoCAD first and then the AV came later. Uh, I think I'm a bit of a unique case because I also had that, you know, underlying drive for understanding how, you know, signal flow worked, how systems come together. Um, I was fascinated with any equipment that had rack ears. If, you know, if, it, if, it, if a piece of gear could be rack mounted, I was drawn to that for some odd reason. I, I don't know why exactly. But like I just loved AV technology and I had the drafting. So for me personally, draft uh, CAD came first and then I learned AV later. And really that is, that is what made AutoCAD more come alive for me was the fact that I learned AV. So I think it depends on the personality. Um, but I do think at some point you've got to, you've got to cross that AV bridge. I mean, there's a lot of people out there, I think that can be, that have CAD skills or they, they're, they're drafters, maybe they're freelance drafters or whatever, and they really understand how AutoCAD works. But at some point, you've got to be able to up your game and understand signal flow and how, you know, you, you can't plug a BNC into an HDMI connector. And, and honestly, most, most, <laughs> yeah. most CAD people um, may, may not know that, but it's like very common right. For anybody who's in AV, they're like, okay, HDMI. You got to plug an HDMI cable into an HDMI port. But right. it's things like that that are very, very basic that sometimes people just haven't thought about or they, they, it's just a different world. So I think yeah. you definitely need that AV um, ability. And some people have it and some people don't. Got it. So it's great to hire someone who already has a propensity and interest for it like you did. But maybe not, you're saying it's maybe not a prerequisite, but if if they don't already have it, it's 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 good it's a very good idea to get them trained in in some basic av once they're on the job yeah send them send them to do the cts yeah they can get through cts there's there's a lot of hope that they i they agree can, you know make that tra transition yeah yeah so so what do you what are you currently up to where where do you um where do you work um and and what would you say if there's an overarching impact that you want to make um by in your in your job what what would you say that what would you say that is on on your end users yeah so i, I currently have been working at a company called image stream medical hmm. okay. for the last five years and so we're we the company is completely 100 percent focused on medical environments and doing av systems um in, in medical and clinical environments so doctors nurses physicians surgeons that's our core um client that's our the medical community is, is our core community that that we serve and we, we make communication systems so that they can communicate within operating rooms and within surgical suites within labs you know all kinds of uh scenarios like that in in hospital settings so that's where i've been focused and i think i think for for what 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 i'm doing right now the biggest thing has to do with regulations and making sure we are compliant with with any HIPAA requirements um, and with the, if, with any other special requirements that each each hospital is a little bit different and has a, you know slightly different approach 
um, to handling technology, to handling, um, uh, you know, devices in a, in a, in a medical environment. And so custom becomes uh, another, it becomes a new challenge to do custom systems in those environments where there's a lot of, there could be regulatory concerns. Um, and, um, you know, what that does is it, is it, it really, um, it forces us as, as people who come from the AV world that are now serving medical people, I think it forces us to really up our game and pay more attention to detail than we normally would, especially with power um, in isolation um, and things like that and not making sure you're not scaling a medical image or doing anything to it that would, you know, unnecessarily impact, you know, quality. So there's, there's just different concerns in the medical world, but I think that's kind of what our company, what ImageStream really excels at is, um, is, is being focused on the, the, the medical community. And like, we've, we've got our whole company of software engineers and mechanical engineers and all kinds of really intelligent, smart people that are, you know, focused on that um, down to the software and the workflow. And then I, I what, what's kind of unique about me is I work for a, in a systems integration department within a medical solutions company. So it's a, it's, mm. it's a little bit, of, it's not your typical, um, you know, AV integrator type of experience. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask. How does it kind of differ from the typical AV designer role? Yeah, I, I think, I think it differs. Um, the, uh, the biggest difference if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, maybe uh, there's a bunch of open positions right now at ImageStream. So if you're thinking about coming on board, I think one of the, one of the big differences it's just the, the timelines, mm-hmm. you know, for, for when um, you, you, you would install a project. Hospitals spend a lot more time planning and preparing. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So installation tends to have a much longer timeline. I mean, some, there are definitely quick turn projects that happen, but I think on the whole, hospitals spend a lot more time uh, planning. So that's just a, it's, it's a difference. Um, um, and I think... I think being in the medical world, it's just, it's really, a, it's a different animal. It's, it's not like your fast paced video, video conferencing huddle room type of integration experience where you can just knock these things out and just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. It's gotta be a lot more thoughtful. And, and as a result, you, you gotta take more, you have to take more time in the process. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's, I think that answers your question. What was your, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the last thing you oh, asked. Like um, for, uh, for overall impact, like how does, how does the existence of image stream medical, help like ultimately improve i guess patient care like what what uh, what patients actually experience what what would you say that that final trickle down impact is on the yeah i mean i think i think one of the so one of the biggest impacts from at least from a patient experience um would be you know the fact that we're not thinking about systems in terms of maybe just one here one there but we're thinking about an enterprise level solution we're thinking about a solution that is integrated with medical records. Um, and so one of, one of the big, you know, selling points for, you know, one of our, our products that we push is, is Easy Suite. And um, that's kind of our integrated in-room routing, recording, streaming type solution. But there's a software um, option that you can buy for that that um, allows you to basically stream or uh, view um, recordings from an iPad, for example. So... You know, if you're a patient, you go in for, you know, maybe, maybe you, you bring in your son or daughter for an operation and they're, you know, recovering, uh, waking up from anesthesia and the parents concerned waiting in the operating room while well, the doctor or the surgeon could come out with an iPad, pull up an example of, yep, here's a picture of the thing we, we, we found, everything's good. And they, you know, just bring it right out to the waiting room or into an office or, or wherever. And you oh, get cool. kind of like that, it, that workflow, that instantaneous kind of, yep, here's what we got. And, right. and, um, that's so that's, cool. that's, that's one of them. And there's, there's more, I mean, when you, when you talk about like hybrid operating rooms, the ability to do an operation and then also do diagnostic scans of, of some sort live while the person is under anesthesia. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things like that, that really enhance the, the, the patient might not even be aware of it, but you can go yeah. under once instead of going under anesthesia, getting sent home, waiting for the labs, Right. Saying, oh, we missed a spot. Let's go back in and get the rest of the cancer or whatever it happens to be. You can yeah. do that live all at the same time and stream the results to a lab somewhere right. else in the building or around the world. So, right. It's a better, better real time visual and audio data surrounding patient procedures, um, things like that, surgeries and whatnot. That's very cool. That's very cool. I didn't know that before. 
Um, I want, want to transition a little bit to um, something I teased in the beginning, the intro of the show, which is um, what you see behind you, <clears throat> the, the AV Shop Talk project. Um, tell me a little bit of, about that. You started it back in 2014, is that correct? Yeah, so I actually launched it back in 2014 in February. So and it's a uh, podcast, right? Yeah, it's a podcast. It's okay. an audio-only podcast. And uh, me and this other fella, Jason Griffin, who is uh, pretty well known in the industry in the residential um, market, writes for various publications. Um, we did. We were we were chatting one time because we were on another podcast and we just happened to be the last two guests kind of that were still lingering on the call. I think it was a Google Hangout at the time. And we just got to chatting and we kind of had a lot of stuff in common. And we were thinking like, oh, maybe, you know, we should start a podcast. We started emailing back and forth and sharing Google Docs and various things. So Jason Griffin and I really launched it together in 2014. Now, now since then, Jason's moved on to other things. Um, but, um, you know, we were, we were looking at the, you know, the, the industry and, you know, thinking, well, maybe we could collaborate and, you know, come together and, and he could provide a residential perspective and I could provide more of a commercial perspective. We could interview guests and talk with manufacturers and, you know, put together a show that would be valuable to other folks in the industry. And that's pretty much how it started. Hmm. Uh, back in, valuable, back in valuable in which way? What, what's your main focus in the podcast? What are the, what are the topics or the kind of people you're looking for? Just, you know, for people who might possibly fit that bill who might be listening. Yeah. So, I mean, when we first started, I got to be honest, we, we didn't really know what we were getting into. We we're just like, this is cool. Let's do a podcast. And then, um, sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. It's cool. It's good to connect with other people. It's like, it's like networking, you know, on steroids because you can just meet so many different people through, through putting this content out there. But, you know, for me personally, I had been a YouTube creator before that, um, doing the, the mm. this, this, a how to channel. Uh, it's it's Big Nate eighty four. So I had been creating YouTube videos and how to tutorials, and I had this underlying theme of like creating content that helps people, and using that to um, you know spread my message and to um, basically form another uh, path of income as well. So being able to monetize the videos and, and kind of like a, a kind of like a side hustle type of a deal where I could earn sure. some extra money on the side. And um, it, it was it's a fun. A lot, it's becoming a lot more popular these days. The people getting involved in side hustles. Yeah. So that that's kind of like my mindset. But like really having the 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 end user, whoever's consuming the content, really focus on what would be a good experience for them in terms of a how-to video, and then translating that into a podcast. What would people in my industry, in the AV industry, really benefit from, and could help them kind of enhance their career? That was kind of the underlying thing. Mm. And um, obviously, you know, if we could get a sponsor, that would be great. That would be fun too and would make the project more fun. But I think for me personally, I look at the big picture. Like if I podcast for 20 years and I interview somebody once a month for 20 years, yeah. how will my professional experience be enriched after, at the end of those 20 years versus not doing it and just keeping my head down, doing my work? So it, it's kind of a, you know, I try to create content that helps other people, enriches their experience. Um, but also it's, it's got a, uh, it's, it's a double-edged sword or it's a two-sided coin where it also helps me tremendously. So uh, it, it's a, it's a great hobby. I, I look at it as more of a hobby. And if I can earn a few dollars on the side, I'm not going to quit my day job, but uh, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're now at this point, uh, four, four years into it, I think, um, almost. And, um, so yeah, this was, I was going to ask what, what's, um, help motivate you most to keep going, you know, for, for a good few years now. Cause a lot of, a lot of, you know, blogs and some podcasts, you know, they're, they're maybe quick to fizzle out, you know, after a year or two. Yeah, that's, that's the challenge. And I think that's when we were, when Jason and I were looking around in 2014, that was one of the things we noticed was, you know, the podcast, the industry podcasts that were available back then, there was really only a handful, like one or two. And then of, of those like one or two, there was, there was a few, there was a bunch of other ones that were intermittent and they, you know, every once in a while you'd hear from somebody, but there wasn't anything consistent. And so for me, I thought what would set us apart is a having really good audio quality um, because of their AV pros that we're talking to. If, if the audio quality is, you know, so, so it's, it's kind of a, it's not the best right off the bat. And then to be consistently producing content 
is the other big thing. So creating content once a month for four years is like a huge accomplishment that I feel very proud of. And it's, it's definitely reaping benefits by having a, a you know, a, a set schedule where you say, okay, the first of the month, there's going to be a new episode every single month. Um, that motivates me sticking to that schedule, being consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and keeping up with the technology too. There, there's just so much to talk about. And, you know, I look at my notes every month and I'm like, I can't, there's no way I can fit everything that happened this month into one show. But <laughs> you know what? I'm going to try to find the cream of the crop, yeah. what interests me the most. And that's kind of my barometer. If, like whatever I'm the most interested in, I go with because I think probably other folks are going to be interested in that too. Not, not all the time, not necessarily, but it's a, it's a little bit different than, you know, maybe a, a, a professional publication where there's professional journalists that aren't necessarily industry insiders. Yeah. But, you know, they do a great yeah. job. We have a lot of great publications, but it's just a different perspective being kind of on the inside and then talking about what, what interests you. So I really enjoy it. I enjoy the back and forth, you know, emails from listeners and, um, you know, Twitter discussions and stuff like that. So I've never had a problem being motivated. I've just, so far, it's been yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, um, I typically this interview series, um, I don't want to focus on technology. Um, I think there's a lot of coverage out there, a really great coverage on, on tech issues. Um, and we're already in a very tech heavy industry, but I think specifically because of, of what you do with AV shop talk, people might be interested to know, kind of what your your gear is in in your setup because obviously you you sound very good um and your your video quality is very good you know you've you've got a a good uh, sort of backdrop that that uh, relates to the show um do you mind in in the show notes um if if uh if i include some of the some of the gear and and setup tips that that you use you've probably documented them by now i'm guessing but just for people who might want to kind of help get a um uh, a head start maybe in, in setting up their own. Yeah, sure. I'd be, I'd be happy to list okay. out Got a few we'll, different we'll that in the show notes and as well as your, uh, as well as your YouTube channel, big Nate 84. Sure. So, okay, cool. Um, so sort of right now I'm going to do what I call a conversational palate cleanser as, as we kind of transition into something, um, completely different topic. What's something people would be surprised to learn about you? Something people will be surprised to learn about. Yeah, so let's see. I don't know if I gave this away already, but you know, I played the saxophone for like six years. The alto. Oh, saxophone. I didn't catch that. Okay. <laughs> so they might be surprised to hear that, but probably what's more surprising is I actually went to my middle school teacher and um, uh, my band instructor, and and honestly went up to him and said, "Hey, can I change instruments?" And he said, yeah, what do you want to switch to? And I said, I, I'd like to switch from saxophone to electric guitar. And this is my concert band in, instructor. And uh, he, he kind of had a, a big laugh at me. He said, there's no electric guitar and concert band, basically. And try to get me to play the tuba, which uh, uh, I, got some, I got some good lessons in negotiating skills. I failed miserably <laughs> negotiating that one. Uh, but ultimately, didn't end up playing tuba. I ended up just quitting and going to, into the garage band. But uh, I don't know, probably exactly when people might be surprised to, to find out. Okay. Ah, cool. Cool. I like that. Um, so you had your sort of Mr. Mr. Holland opus moment. <laughs> with your with your band teacher that's funny yeah mr um, wall <laughs> give him a shout out here <laughs> yeah exactly um so i want to ask you a um a question if if you could go back in time to when you started in av and say professionally and and give your younger self only one piece of advice what would that be it would be to really focus on um, education, continuing education from, um, you know, from Infocom or from, from Avixa uh, and from um, manufacturer training and to not wait for a manager to kind of offer training, but to proactively set up a, a, an Excel sheet or something and say, okay, you know, this quarter I'm going to do these two classes and the next quarter I'm going to do these two. And just to really take ownership um, once you get in the AV industry of, of your personal, AV, what I would call your AV education to keep continuing to learn. Um, yeah, that's probably the best piece of advice. Really own that personal education side of it. That's cool. That's cool. Um, 
want to want to ask you a one one last question as we as we kind of um, wrap up here. Uh, I've talked to a lot of AV sales engineers from around different parts of the all different parts of the country, and one of the things that steals their enjoyment from their work um, almost all the time uh, for almost everyone is that despite their best efforts product details always seem to slip through the design process and, and get forgotten uh, until the install crew is is on site and realizes what's missing which by then is you know really really too late and, and starts causing a lot of uh, problems and and wasted wasted effort and running around and, and uh, extra money um, what I'm what I'm talking about is are those ten dollar accessories. You know what they are: the the mounting adapters, the power supplies, the PoE injectors, pre made cables, all that stuff that become a hundred dollar problems when they have to be solved reactively. You know during install rather than proactively during design. Was there a time in your AV integration career when you noticed a lot of that going on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, when I was, so I started off, uh, um, you know, after, after I did the stagehand thing, I, I got a job in commercial integration as an installer and I, I was an intern and then I was an installer for about six months before I started doing the drafting for AV. Mm -hmm. um, but um, being out on site and not having that one little 10, like you said, that $10 item to, mm -hmm. you know, connect the uh, the rgbhv run to the uh the projector or not having the the right bncs or not having you know bnc to rca can you know we use those things all the time or, or <laughs> yeah. stupid bnc to rca adapters yeah i know i hated those things it's garbage right but everybody used them i mean there's it's, yep yep <laughs> they're not so popular anymore but you know things like that definitely noticed pain points and um just being out on site and not having the right stuff. Oh, it's just such a waste because you've, you've spent the drive time. You're, you're an hour away, an hour and a half away. And now you can't, you have to come back for a second, a second trip. And it's just a, it's a killer to the margin of a project. And um, so as an installer, I saw that also noticed it as a drafter when I'm, you know, looking at this as when I was looking at sketches from design engineers and I was, you know, putting together the final CAD package kind of, I was another set of eyes that got to see the the project and I could see, Oh, Hey, we, you know, we don't have the, you know, these, these silly BNC to RCA adapters on the parts list anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, we could, we could add those in, or maybe it's a, a BNC breakout at the time. That's, that's BNCs were, were, were hot back then when, when I, <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. You're living, you're living in the BNC days there. Go yeah. On. I was tripped down uh, memory lane there, but um. yep. I mean, it could be patch cables too. You know, you, you need a six foot patch cable and you've only got a three foot or, you right, know, right. you've only got a six foot and, 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 if, things like and that. if you're lucky, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's at the shop in, in sort of your con bins, but that wasn't always necessarily the case, right? It wasn't, it wasn't always a PC you could go back to the shop and, and that you guys stocked, right? It, you know, the worst case scenario is something that they had to go back and, and place an order for, right? So maybe they could only source it from the manufacturer Right. And, like that. and then there's the logistical, you know, accounting of it too. It's like, okay, so you're, you've got this, this, this installer that has their own van and they've got van stock and then you've got floor stock in, at the shop. And, you know, how do you charge that? Who's keeping track of how you charge that, you know, to, to, a, to a certain project. And then, you know, there are systems out there that allow you to do that. But, you know, is the installer really concerned about, you know, that type of accounting or is the installer just want to get the system working and get out of there and get down to the next one. It's, it's, yeah. that's, that's the real challenge is not, is not having the every little bit and piece at the right time mm -hmm. and then accounting for it properly. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find it was usually those, those small dollar items were the ones that went missing or the ones that got forgotten? Yeah. I mean, yeah the bigger ticket items, the major components. Definitely. It, it depended on how, how, how well the uh, the installer you know kept track of their van stock and it, it honestly comes down to two like looking at the signal flows in advance and, and a, a good installer will read the flows see what they need realize hey I don't have this you know bit of velcro or, or bit of uh, you know um, expandable loom or, or whatever it is and mm -hmm. I'm going to dock that and to kind of take you know responsibility for it versus what happens if it showed up on the bill of materials and the installer just got everything that they needed, you know, right. 
in the box when they got on site. I mean, that's right. a completely different kind of paradigm, but that allows you to control uh, quality a lot more too, if you can mm. if you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're talking about some things that that will never show up on a bill of materials, right? Like your <clears throat> like your tech flex, um, and you know your zip ties and things like that. That that have to get they they're always going to have to be part of a well stocked uh, van, right? But, but there's also other things that uh, do need to get reflected and captured on the on the bill materials um did you have any insight into how what the process was that kind of led to those things slipping through the cracks and, and not getting added to the bomb when they should have been back in the design process yeah i mean it really i think it comes down to um kind of a sales engineering approach versus like a, a final engineering approach sure. so i think a lot of people live in the kind of the sales engineering world where they're really good at getting um a quote together and a bucket of dollars together and say okay yeah. we need this codec this amp these speakers these displays this projector this screen and those big ticket items uh, you know people i think pe there's a lot of people that are highly skilled at identifying the big ticket items and then saying yeah, and you're gonna need a couple hundred dollars of miscellaneous stuff and just pop right. those things on there right but, being able to actually go into the miscellaneous and say, okay, let's really define the miscellaneous. That's kind of like the grunt work that nobody really wants to do. And it just kind of, that's why it falls through the cracks because nobody wants to take the time um, and necessarily think that through. Um, um, I force myself to do it all in my current role. I, I think about those things all the time and I just kind of have to swallow my pride and say, you know what? I want this project to go well. So I personally have to dedicate resources to that and train other people to think that way too, that are, you know, um, coming up in the industry or maybe new to the team. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not something that uh, people, people don't gravitate towards defining the, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars of miscellaneous items. It's, it's it definitely, uh, it, it definitely seems like it, it falls squarely in the, um, the, the realm of a chore, you know, um, and it usually falls on the, the, uh, the, the engineer, um, depending on the company, I think, you know, they may, the design engineer, the sales engineer and the, the design engineer may be the same person. They may be different people. Um, most of my roles that that's been the same person. It's all been part of my responsibility, but you're right. Whether it's done by one, the same person or two different engineers, they are, those steps are disconnected in time. One happens when you're trying to get the work and you don't know if you're going to, you know, if the customer is going to bite. So you don't want to spend the extra time it takes to dot every I and cross every T on your quote. But then for those that do turn into a PO, someone's got to do that work before it goes to purchasing or exactly what you've been saying is going to happen time and time again. And I think it's more, I think it's more of a process problem than, than a, than a people problem. Um, I'm not, I'm not bagging on engineers. I think that's a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of responsibility to, to put on the, them, um, to have nothing to, to kind of help with that, uh, to kind of come alongside and, and help them leverage their time to, to catch that. It's sort of all, all on them. Um, so yeah, this is, this has been a super fun, um, interview. I've, I really enjoyed it, Nate. Um, and I want to just kind of leave with, with, uh, with one last kind of a, kind of a, a fluff question to, to, to wind us down, kind of a fun question. Think of, think of your top 10 movies. Okay. Which one of them would you say is underrated or unknown to maybe the most people don't know about? Oh, top 10 movies. Oh man. That's, this is a good one. So I like, um, Man, I, so I'm ruling so, out all the the Star Wars and the you know the big box office ones. Which 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 one of your top is is you know kind of underrated? Well, you know one of the there's there's this film there's this movie on Netflix that I for some reason really enjoy. I don't know if it's in my top ten, but there's this it's it's, it's called Troll Hunter, and my wife makes fun of me so bad because I think it's the coolest. It's it's like in like Norwegian. It's like a mockumentary type of movie, but I just like I love like the the approach to it. It's like total. It's subtitled, 
I show it to people and they look at me like I've got like, you know, <laughs> you know three heads or whatever. But That's great. It, it's not one of the best movies out there, but there's something about that troll hunter. Look it up. If, if you okay. if you haven't seen I will. it. You'll probably watch the first five minutes of it and then you'll be like, <laughs> be like what? <laughs> that's great. Well, that's cool. Well, awesome. I'll, I'll definitely check it out. So thanks. Thanks for coming on, Nate. And um, we will we will talk to you later. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Okay. No problem. Thanks, man.